Let us go to the Lord in prayer. Lord God, I come to you in the name of Jesus. Power, glory, and honor be yours forever, God. I am not worthy to stand up here in front of these folks and deliver this message. I pray, God, you wash me and cleanse me with your blood, Lord. Forgive me of uh, my shortcomings, God. And we just thank you for giving us your word. Uh, Lord, we pray you open our hearts today. Uh, Lord, uh, you, you'd not let me say anything that is out of the way. Uh, God, we just uh, uh, we want to uh, learn more about you. Lord, be with these, be with Mark, be with others, Lord, that are hurting, sick, and afflicted. Lord, we want to lift up the persecuted today, Lord, those that are suffering for your name's sake, Lord, that are abandoned and abused and tortured and uh, having terrible things done to them, God. And you love them just as much as you love us, Lord. We've got it so good. We just want to lift them up to you right now. You give them grace and mercy, uh, Lord, that you would uh, give them faith to endure whatever it is that they're going through. We ask in Jesus' name, amen. amen. All right, okay, we're getting right back where we picked up last week. We're going over essential doctrines of biblical Christianity. We talked about last week, uh, we talked a little bit about why doctrine is important. Why is, why is doctrine important? Anybody? What will bad doctrine do? Yeah, It'll send you to hell. Bad doctrine will send you to hell. And the sad reality is that, and y'all heard me say this, and it's an absolute fact that most people that call themselves Christians are going to hell uh, because they have the wrong doctrine. And uh, we know that, uh, uh, that that narrow is the gate and, uh, and broad is the way. You know, that, that, that passage is, is, is addressed to people who believe in God. You know, we read that passage about the broad road to hell, and we think about it, he's talking about the world. That's not what that passage is talking about. He's talking about religious people. The religious road is broad that leads to hell. Because religion, that's where it sends you. Religion sends you to hell. And uh, and we know that faith in Jesus Christ will get you to heaven. And we've got to have good doctrine. And so we're going to go over the central doctrines. And right now we are on the authority of Scripture. And we started that last week. We talked about Scripture. Can you trust your Bible? Um, and we'll talk about that. Can you trust your Bible? How about this? Can you trust the Bible? We're going to talk about that. There's lots of Bibles. Boy, there's lots of Bibles. And this is where we're going to, we're going to get some of y'all twisted up here in a little bit. But let's talk about the words of God, Scripture. We learned some things about Scripture last week, and I got this up here. What is scripture? First, it's written words. You know, the Holy Spirit. We learned that last week the Holy Spirit moved on holy men of old and gave them words. Now, we don't know exactly how that went down. There's, there's theories about how these guys uh, uh, got scripture. Did the Holy Spirit speak to them audibly and they wrote it down? Did the Holy Spirit just take over their body and they went to writing? Uh, we really don't care. I don't care about that. It don't matter to me. I know that the word of God was given to holy men of old and they recorded it. And it is wrote down. And it is words. Come in, sister. And so what did we talk about last week? Here is the cop out. And, and all of we all of us do it, uh, especially Bible teachers and scholars. Let me just tell you what. You have got to not put your faith in men. Now look, we all need to have teachers. Y'all are in this room and y'all are trusting that I have done my due diligence and studied this word and I have mentors and teachers that I listen to, but I'm going to tell you what, you got to filter everything you hear through the word of God. Everything you hear from me, everything you hear from any respected Bible teacher, scholar, I'm going to tell you, I'll tell you I'm going to tell you who corrupts men of God. And it is a, it, it, it is a, I'm not going to call it a necessary evil, uh, but it has, uh, it has its benefits. A higher education corrupts everybody. It just does. So while seminary is incredibly important uh, for those that want to, you know, uh, have a vocation in ministry and learn and all of that, but but th these these things are taught by guys that are corrupted nine ways from Sunday. Many good, godly men. You can be good, godly, and corrupted. We're going to talk about that and unknowingly. Uh, but 
scripture are written words by written by holy men of and they're the words of God. You know, uh, this is what atheists say. Well, men wrote that. Well, they did. Men did write it. Men did write that down. But they're the words of God. And every word in Scripture is in there for a reason. That's why I said when we was talking about reading through this Bible, look, you need to have two things going on in your private life. You need to be reading this book. This is the problem with our country today. Nobody reads the book. Amen. They're sitting in front of that television. That's what y'all do. You go home and turn that TV on. Y'all aren't reading your Bible or the radio or whatever. I'm just messing with you. Maybe y'all do do that. <laughs> but the vast majority of people, that's what they do. And the vast majority of people, they 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 got other things going on. And so uh, we got to read this book. Just get on it, read it. And then you got to study it. And it's different. It's different studying the word and reading the word. So you need to be reading it. Just get it and read it. Just every day. Just read it, read it, read it through. Read the whole Bible through. Read the Old Testament. Read the New Testament. However you want to read it, read it. Read all of it. Even get through, remember we talked about them names. Oh my oh. goodness, what a beat down. An absolute beat down numbers, you know. And, and you know Leviticus you get in there and you're talking about the temple and all of the articles and all that read it all read every bit of it even if you don't understand it even if you can't pronounce it make an attempt and then study it that's different get you a good reference Bible and you go down through there and scripture interprets scripture that's how we know what the word of God means it, it, it interprets itself you got to get in there and you got to dig. You can't do that, just read. But it's the words of God. It's perfect. What, we, what we're talking about here in this doctrine of the authority of Scripture is the infallibility of the Word of God. It is infallible. It is inerrant. There aren't any errors in it. Now, most every Christian that you'll talk to today will say there's errors in the Bible. They'll say it. And they'll point them out to you. Well, this spelling here, or this Greek word here, and blah, blah, blah. Let me tell you what. If you've got errors in the book, can you trust it? If it's got errors, well, what, what if the deity of Christ is an error? What if the crucifixion is an error? No. The word of God doesn't have errors in it. We talked about it being alive. The word of God's alive. You remember, it has characteristics of a person. It says the word sees. The word foresees. The word discerns. What were some of them other things? Uh, it says, it preaches, it raises people up. This is scripture, man. You'd think that would be God. But Paul is writing this down and he says, the scripture says to Pharaoh. The scripture says, the scripture foresees. See, the word's alive. It is sharper than a two-edged sword. And who does it work in? Believers. We learned that last week. The Word of God tells us that this book, it will not do anything to someone that doesn't believe. It's just words on paper. I told y'all there are, there are uh, Bible professors in every seminary in this country. They're atheists. They're teaching our pastors, by the way. And they're, 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 they can quote you this scripture and they can teach it and they can teach it in context and all that. They don't believe it and it won't work in them. This word is only alive. It only works in those that believe. you got to believe and it'll work in you. The word brings salvation. Faith comes by what? Hearing. And hearing by? The word of God. That's right. That's how you get saved. Somebody tells you the word of God. Now, maybe they're not reading it out of the Bible, but they got it out of the Bible. And so when you hear the word of God, that is, that is God revealing himself to you. And remember, the Holy Spirit on the lost person is working from the outside. What's the Holy Spirit doing with the world? It's convicting the world of sin and righteousness, right? So you got the Holy Spirit working on the outside. And what we, we've learned in Romans that God gives every man what inside a conscience, right? And so the man, the conscience that's inside of you, of a lost man, the conscience is saying, there's God, there's God, there's God. 
and look at the sun, look at the stars, look at the sky, look at the design. Remember, creation alone will send you to hell. You can't look at creation and deny there's God. And so whenever you get that conscience on the inside saying there's a God, there's a God, there's a God, and then God sends somebody to send you the word, whether you heard it on the radio or television or somebody witnessed to you or you stumbled into a church or you picked up a gospel tract and whatever, then that word comes in and the Holy Spirit saying that's true, that's true, that's true. And your conscience is saying that's true, that's true, that's true. And so you got all these things working, three things working on you. And then you got a choice to make. For a lot of people, they'll just turn away. But faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God. So it brings salvation. And so look at your uh, uh, your handouts there. Everybody get a handout, by the way? Uh, we didn't get quite through with what is scripture. And so somebody read John 5, 46. This is Jesus talking. Forty. For if you believe Moses, you would believe me, for he wrote about me. But if you do not believe me, believe his writings, how will you believe my words? Okay, his what? Words. No, his, his, what, is, what before words? Right. His writing. writing. And so, so look, look at that, his words. Words. Here's the big cop out, the word of God. Here's, here's what, you, what you're going to have these people say. I believe the word of God is infallible and inerrant. Well, what's the word of God? See, that's the broad deal. And a lot of them say, well, the original autographs. That's, that's, what the, that's what the scholars will say. It's the original autographs that are inerrant and infallible. Do you have the original autographs? No. I'm talking about the original scrolls that these guys wrote this thing down. Do you have them? Well, what good are they? Well, yeah. If I had the original scroll of Isaiah right here in this classroom that was 3,500 years old, what could I do with it? Could you understand it? I couldn't. I couldn't read it. The words, the words of God. <clears throat> Somebody read John 14. Jesus answered and said to him, If anyone loves me, he will keep my word, and my Father will love him, and we will come to him and make our home with him. If anyone loves me, he will keep my precepts. Will he keep my uh, my word? What's he say? Words. He keeps my words. My ideas. My fundamentals, the fundamentals of biblical Christianity. He says, "You will keep my words." So we we got to believe we got the words, right? If Jesus says he who loves me will keep my words, we got to believe we got the words of God. Where am I at? John eight. Mm -hmm. Somebody do that. He who is God hears God's words. He who is of God hears God. God's words. Therefore, you do not hear because you are not of God. So you're going to hear his words. Somebody read Matthew 4 4. But he answered and said, It is written, Man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeds from the mouth of God. Every word. <laughs> See, it's a lot of people starve to death. You know, you, we feed our face, most of us, three times a day. That's our flesh, our wicked, corrupt flesh. You know, we're, we're in bondage to our flesh. Our soul lives inside our flesh, remember? And if you have been born again, you've been spiritually circumcised so that your soul is not attached to your flesh inside. The circumcision done without human hands, what the Word of God says, the Holy Spirit does that. So the minute you're born again, the Holy Spirit goes inside your body and he separates your soul from your flesh. And your soul looks just like your body. Remember, we learned that. Uh, your soul has eyes, ears, and a tongue, and it can hear, and it can see, and it can smell, and it can taste, and it can feel. That's how people can burn in hell forever. The body's not material, but it, 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 it has all of these characteristics of a body. 
and many people are feeding their flesh and you got to have your flesh and you need to feed your flesh you need to take care of your flesh but you need to understand your flesh is your enemy but how many people feed their soul there's a lot of Christians that starve to death because they don't eat the word of God and man just go without eating for a few days and see how weak you get but we live by every word that proceeds out of the mouth of God all right, somebody read Revelation 22. And if anyone takes away from the words of the book of this prophecy, God shall take away his part from the book of life, from the holy city, and from the things which are written in this book. We're going we're gonna to look at this. You all remember that. If anyone takes away the words of this book, when we get uh, later on and we talk about Bible translations and, and and ancient texts and all. Y'all remember that. If anyone takes away the words of this book, you know, and that's in Revelation, and some people think, well, that's just talking about the book of Revelation. No, he's talking about the book. He's talking about the book. Take away the words. You'd be shocked at how many words have been pulled out of Revelation in some translations. All right, and so... My point is this, that when, when we're talking about is the, can you trust the word of God? Is it infallible and inherent? We've got to believe we have the words of God. If we don't think we've got the words of God, we can't be sure. And we've got to be sure. Because we've got to have a book that's authoritative. That's the difference in, in Christianity and all these other religions. We have a book that has authority from God. It is alive. It has a, a personality and characteristics. It's written outside of time. The one that wrote this book is looking back on all the events. That's why people say this isn't true. They're saying there's no way that somebody could have been so accurate with this book. And we're going to talk a little bit about apologetics. Not much. I, we could spend, I could spend two or three weeks on apologetics is defense of the book and all of the evidences and we're going to look at a few right now about uh, how, why you can trust your Bible see God just doesn't expect you to have blind faith that's ridiculous but Christianity is not blind faith I mean I mean he gives us evidence after evidence after evidence Paul says to defend you can argue there's people who say you can't prove that Bible's true. You can prove that Bible's true. It's easy to prove that Bible's true. Easy. And Jesus gives us evidences and evidences and evidences. More and more and more all the time. Archaeology. I mean, that's what we could spend. We could spend. I mean, they're making. Uh, I, you know, I, I watch that stuff, and man, they'll make new. Uh, they'll make new discoveries every three or four weeks over there proving the Bible is true. And so God doesn't just expect you to accept because somebody stands up there and says, this book is my word and it's inerrant and infallible to believe them. He's going to let you see there's evidence that you can rely on, that you can look to. And so whenever you start doubt, whenever the Satan, you remember what he did? What did he do with Eve? How did he do it? Doubt what? Doubt the word. Hath God really said? Did God really say? See, See, Satan always starts with a question. Did you notice that? He always has a question. If thou art the Son of God, he always starts. See, he's, he's all about casting doubt. Now, you don't have to doubt this word. All right, let's look at some pretty fun facts that would tell you that this book is true. What are some things the Bible talks about thousands of years before man discovered them? I've got that in quotes. And hey, look, this is the tip of the iceberg, okay? This is just, it's just if you want to get into this, just geek out on it. You can, there, there is uh, there's lots of stuff you can go to. But uh, I just pulled some fun stuff out. Um, uh, this one right here says, The Bible explains the earth is round and suspended in space thousands of years before this was discovered and understood by man. Somebody read that, Isaiah 40, 22. It is he who sits above the circle of the earth, and his inhabitants are like grasshoppers. 
He stretches out the heavens like a curtain and spreads them out like a tent to dwell in. Okay, this was written in 712 BC. That's 2750 years before this was understood by science. Mm -hmm. <laughs> What did the scientists used to say the earth was? Wow. And square, right? <laughs> yeah. This is what scientists used to tell us. You, you can understand, these scientists, man, they're going to lead you astray. Boy. So they used to say the earth was flat and square. And the word of God is telling them all along, no, it's round. It's round. What about, uh, read that next one. Not only is it round, what does Job 26, 7 say? He stretches out the north over empty space. He hangs the earth on nothing. He hangs the earth on nothing. So we know the earth is round and the earth is just hanging out there on nothing. It's in space. It's in space. And that was written 780, 1780 B.C., 3150 years before that was discovered in 1650. So man... He's got it written right there in the Word of God. He could trust the Word of God, and he could just understand that the earth is round and it's in space, but he's got to wait 3,000 years before he can figure that out. When you just, you just got to trust the Word. You just think about how more advanced our society would be if men had just trusted the Word of God. That's 3,000 years, folks. Here's another one. Somebody read Luke 17, 30. Even so will it be in the day when the Son of Man is revealed. In that day, he who is on the housetop and his goods are in the house, let him not come down to take them away. And likewise, the one who is in the field, let him not come back. Remember Lot's wife. Whoever seeks to save his life will lose it, and whoever loses his life will preserve it. I'll tell you, in that night there will be two men in one bed, the one will be taken and one will be left. You ever thought about that? What is the implication of that right there? In that day, in that night. How can you have day and night at the same time? Come on, man, the earth's a globe. It's round. So, so it's day in one side of the planet, it's light on the other side of the planet. I mean, this is Luke, man. This is in Luke. How many times have people read that passage of scripture and did not understand the, the earth is round and it's light on this side of the earth and it's not on the other side. See, you're not going to beat this book. It is thousands and thousands and thousands of years ahead of mankind. It's written by the creator of all of that stuff. If you'll just believe it. People don't believe it. They don't believe it. They'll read it and they'll say, well, that's figurative. This is what all of our, uh, many of our reformed brothers, you know, they believe that all this is figurative. It's, it's uh, not literal. No, we literally believe this book unless it's, it, it is obvious that it's not written to be literal, like a parable. You can know, when you read a parable, you know that's not literal. When Jesus says, I'm the door, you know that he's not a, a door. So the Bible is obvious when it's not literal. Here, here's, here's the way you need to read the Bible. You always take it literal unless you can't. If there's any doubt, you take it literal. But I mean, that 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 was Luke. It was written 33 AD, 1600 years before men figured out. Oh, the earth is round. All right, here's a fun one. Jet stream and wind currents in the water cycle. The Bible speaks about wind currents and the water cycle thousands of years before being discovered by man. Somebody read Ecclesiastes there. The wind goes towards the south and turns around to the north. The wind whirls around continually and comes again on its circuit. All the rivers run into the sea, yet the sea is not full. To the place from which the rivers come, there they return again. So that was written 977 BC, 3400 years before the jet stream was discovered. And 2600 years before the water cycle was understood. And it's right there in the words of God. Somebody read Job 38. Have you entered the springs of the sea or have you walked in search of the dead? The springs of the sea. Again, man didn't discover fresh water was in the ocean until 1860. 
So, I mean, I'm telling you, man, I mean, just read that Bible. Here's one. Moon does not produce light. Somebody read Job 25. <laughs> Behold, even the moon does not shine, and the stars are not pure in his sight. The moon does not shine. Yeah. Yeah, and it wasn't until, uh, what, uh, 3,200 years before they discovered that it was reflecting the light of the sun. They thought the, the moon gave its own light. It was just different. And the Word of God told them right there, no, that moon's not shining. It's reflecting. Here's a big one. In electricity can speak. Yeah. You know? Somebody read Job 38. <laughs> and you send out lightnings that they may go and say to you, here we are. Electric electricity talking? That's written <laughs> 1780. It's 3,700 years before the telephone was invented. I, man, there's a big controversy over who did been a telephone. When I was looking that up, I mean, uh, Alexander Graham Bell and these other guys, and they're duking it out in court. But the point is this. Electricity can talk. You can, that's how you can, you can say something here, and, and you can, and even wireless, because electricity and light, that they, you know, when they figured out that was the same thing. And so that's how you can talk here, and automatically on the other side of the world, they can hear you instantly at the speed of light. It's proof that God provides all that we need. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Here's another one, ocean currents. Somebody read eight, uh, Psalm 8, 8. The birds of the air and the fish of the sea that pass through the paths of the seas. The paths of the seas. 2,600 years before oceanographers discovered ocean currents. Here's a cool one. The unsinkable Noah's Ark. Let me just tell you, man, if you can afford to get to Kentucky, you need to go to the Ark Encounter. You just need to do it. If you are if you go, if you're a person that goes on vacations, just plan a vacation to Ark Encounter, especially if you've got children. It will absolutely uh, reinforce uh, the literal uh, interpretation of the book. You know, and I've talked about this before when we went up there. You know, you don't think about it, and, 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 and we trick our children. And Satan, let me tell you what, in that ark, they have this uh, they have this room that is full of books, children's books. And it's, and it's got a big old serpent that's over the doorway. I mean, this big, huge serpent's coiling around the doorway. And the sign, I took a picture of that sign. I think it said, if I can get you to believe the flood, the flood is a fairy tale, I can get you to believe the Bible is a fairy tale or something mm -hmm. like that. And so you go in this room and it's full of children's books about Noah's Ark. And you know what? They all have some similar deal that's like this. And then they got a giraffe sticking out. What are you telling your children? That's a fairy tale. That's what that is. And that's why you got people that believe, don't believe that Noah's Ark is real. I'm going to tell you what, you go up there to that ark encounter and they built that thing to the specs of the Bible and you can carry 30,000 sheep in that thing. You can carry, uh, well, it's more than that. It, 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 there's no problem getting all the species of all the animals on the planet that day and having all of the ways to feed them and tend them. And uh, I'm just telling you. And the watering system. Uh, anyway, where am I at? All right. <laughs> Somebody read Genesis 6, 13. And God said to Noah, <clears throat> The end of all flesh has come before me, for the earth is filled with, with violence through them, and behold, I will destroy them with the earth. Make yourself an ark of gopher wood, make rooms in the ark, and cover it inside and out with pitch, and this is how you shall make it. The length of the ark shall be 300 cubits, its width 50 cubits, and its height 30 cubits. So, in 1993, a South Korean, I don't know, it was a, I don't know if it was a universal, it did a study, and they determined the, the dimensions of the ark given in the Bible were the perfect ratio, and it can't sink. In fact, it is so perfect that from that point, they began uh, designing modern cruise ships to mimic the dimensions of the ark. Now, it's different because the ark wasn't having any propulsion, and so that there's a little difference there, but... But the ark is unsinkable. They've done the, they've done the, the 
Uh, Chuck Missler's got a cool deal on that. Look that up on YouTube. He, he's got, he shows how the ark is unsinkable. Uh, but see, it's real. This book's real, man. You can believe it. You can trust it. Here's a cool one. Protection from microscopic germs. Leviticus. Somebody read Leviticus 13. He shall be unclean all the days he has the sore. He shall be unclean. He is unclean and he shall dwell alone. His dwelling shall be outside the camp. So God is teaching people to quarantine. Man, man that was written 1490 B.C. 3,200 years before men figured out you needed to quarantine the sick. When all they had to do was look at the Word of God. You know why them Jews and the Black Death in the Middle Ages, you know why they got blamed? You know why they got blamed for uh, that deal, the conspiracy that the Jews brought that death? Somebody read this Leviticus 15. And when he who has a discharge is cleansed of his discharge, then he shall count for himself seven days for his cleansing, wash his clothes, and bathe his body in running water. Then he shall be clean. In what? Running water. You know why them Jews didn't die in the Black Death? They followed the Word of God. They washed their hands in running water. They quarantined those that were sick. And, and, and look, that's 3,400 years before science figured out. I mean, they're, they're, they're in the Civil War. Them, them guys are washing their hands in a bowl of water. A nasty bowl of bloody water. And they're inside one body. And they wash their hands in that bloody bowl of water. And, they end up, and then people are dying by the thousands. And it wasn't until the 1600s. Well, I mean... I didn't put the date on when. But I mean, well, that'd have been the 1800s. They were still doing that. When all they had to do was read the book. And that had it figured out. Think of the millions of people that lost their lives due to germs. Because the, the, somebody in the scientific community, these geniuses that everybody looks to that's so smart couldn't read that word. It's sad. What about dinosaurs? We're going to have to... A, this is a long passage. I'll read this one. We're going to turn to Job 40. Job 40. Everybody wants to know about dinosaurs. What's the deal with dinosaurs? What's the Bible have to say about dinosaurs? You got my glasses. I can probably get to this. see what the Bible says about dinosaurs. Uh, 40, 15. Look now at the behemoth which I will made along, which I made along with you. What's that tell you? Dinosaurs and men together. That's why down there in that Glen Rose, you know, they're going to be dinosaur footprints or human footprints with them. He, the dinosaurs, the humans were here when di the dinosaurs weren't here 60 million years ago. Th that is just ridiculous, ridiculous garbage. And we've all been brainwashed. Every single one of you in here that's been in school have been brainwashed. And and we have we have an a, a evolutionary time scale in our mind. And why do you got to believe all this stuff is millions and millions of years old? Because according to that uh, crazy guy, you know Darwin was crazy. Do a little research on Darwin. He was an absolutely nuts. Time plus carbon equals life. Now that's why you got. That's why they got to get you to believe that everything's millions and millions and millions of years old. Because it tries to cut God, but that can't even cut God out of the picture because even they had to admit the law of thermodynamics, they finally had to admit, oh, there was a there was a creation at some point, but it wasn't a creator. It was, anyway, I can get off and all of that. <laughs> all right, let's read. He eats grass like an ox. So that's something we know about this animal. See how now his strength is in his hips and the power in his stomach muscles. 
Have you seen these brontosauruses and, and, and how, how long they are and, and uh, how long their tail is and, 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 and how their dimensions? See, they got to have these powerful hips to, to be able to carry all of that weight. You'll learn that in the art field. He moves his tail. Uh, he moves his tail like a cedar. So that's a pretty big tail. Yeah. The trunk of a tree. You know, these people say that's a hippopotamus. I mean, I ain't never seen a hippopotamus with a tail the size of a tree. <laughs> the sinews of his side, thighs are tightly knit. His bones are like beams of bronze. Have you seen the, how big them bones are? His ribs are bars of iron. He is the first of the ways of God. Only he who made him can bring near his sword. Lord, you ain't going to kill one of these things. God can, you can't. Surely the mountains yield food for him, and all the beasts of the field play there. He lies under the lotus trees in a covert of weeds and marsh. The lotus trees cover him with their shade. The willows by the brook surround him. Indeed, listen to this. Indeed, the river may rage, yet he is not disturbed. He's so big and so tall, he can be in the middle of that river, and that water is rushing that enough to you know sweep anything away, and he ain't even disturbed. He is confident, though the Jordan rushes into his mouth. So this 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 dinosaur is so tall, that when the when the Jordan River is running bank full, it's up there to his head, and he just he just loving it. He ain't worried about it. The sucker's huge, though he takes it in his eyes. But, so that water he's he's up head high, or one pierces his nose with a snare. There's more about dinosaurs, Joe. But there you are. Uh, the Bible speaks of dinosaurs. Could that be anything else, by the way? Any other animal would meet those descriptions? That was written 1780 B.C., 3,500 years before archaeologists began to study dinosaur bones. We could go on and on and on and on. I mean, I could do three or four lessons on apologetics from the Bible. I mean, you can trust your Bible, y'all. It's real. It's written by God. There aren't any errors in it. If you'll just listen to it, it'll profit you. Not only your soul, but we, as we talked all these things, think about how much better all mankind would have been if it had just been doing these things that the Bible talked about. All right. What time is it? You got 15 minutes. Uh, it's probably enough. <clears throat> We're fixing to get... Some of y'all, we y'all are going to get some opinion on this, okay? Informed, educated opinion. Some of you might not like it. Some of you can disagree, and you're perfectly fine to do that. I, I, I mean, we're, we can, we can uh, agree to disagree in a respectful way and all of that stuff. We're going to talk about what, what what book are we studying out of? New King James. It's the New King James Bible. And the elders of this church have determined that we're going to use the New King James to study scripture with. Praise God for that. We're going to, we're going to ask this question, why is the King James Bible authoritative English translation? King James. Now, what you got in the King James, you've got uh, basically <clears throat> two uh, uh, translations of the King James. You got the King James, and you got the New King James. And um, we're gonna we're gonna see. If, you got to believe that what you're reading are the words of God. W O R D S, the words of God. And so we need to know is the King James Bible the word of God, because that's what we're using. We're not using any other translation. Yeah, you can have other I got other translations. And let me just tell you right now. I got saved in 1988. And the preacher was preaching out of the old King James Bible. And uh, that's what I got saved listening to. And uh, got started reading it, and my godly nana daughter—that's the most godly woman I ever knew. You knew 
her well. Uh, and she's, I, you know, my salvation a lot. I, I tell you what, I know, I know she prayed for me a bunch, and I, and I got saved right out of the pit of hell. You know that, brother. Out of dope and, and alcohol and debauchery and all that kind of lifestyle. But my, she gave me a, a, a new international version. Five. NIV, and it was printed, the NIV came out in 1978, uh, and then it was revised in uh, in, in early 80s, and then it was revised again and again, again, and so she handed me this NIV Bible, and I began to read, and I understood it, boy, it's easy to read, and I grew in the Lord, I read it cover to cover, I read the whole Bible after my salvation cover to cover, I think in four months, I was reading the Bible hours and hours and hours a day, standing up at midnight, I couldn't get enough of it, I'd read, 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 and I learned, and I grew, and, and, and I'm glad I had that, I just trusted that it was okay, I mean, because I trusted the one that gave it to me, I read that Bible for 20 years, and it, and the Lord blessed a lot with it. And so uh, I just want y'all to know whenever I'm talking about, I mean, uh, you know, if, if, you, if you've got a favorite Bible translation that you're reading, I did too. And you can take what I'm telling you for whatever it's worth, but I'm going to tell you why we're teaching out of the King James Bible in this class. Why is it authoritative English translation? And I'm saying English because... Because there are lots of translations out there of the Bible. There's there's Spanish and there's French. I mean, you know, there's a jillion of them now. Uh, German and all that. We're talking about English. Are, if anybody here speaks, anybody here speak other language other than English as your primary language? Texan. Right. <laughs> so there's no Texan Bibles. <laughs> so what? So what we're dealing with is the English translation. If you speak English, what Bible do you need to be reading? That's the question. What Bible do you need to be reading if you're speaking English? And so that's that's what we're getting at. Or, or, or let me let me back up. What Bible do you need to be studying? Because there's a difference. Reading and studying. What did I tell you? You need to be reading the Bible. You need to be studying the Bible. Get, if you want to read, it don't matter what kind of Bible translation you want to read. And I don't want to read the Word of God myself. But look, if you, if you it's easy to you read one translation over the other. There's nothing wrong with that. Read that thing. But if you're going to study. You need to study the authoritative word of the living God. And I'm going to make the argument that you got it right there in your hand if you got a King James Bible. All right, number one. It is translated from the majority text or the textus receptus. Uh, you know, and, and the, the major works of that, they're uh, Erasmus 1516, Colonnaeus 1534, Stephanus 1546. And it is not out of the Alexandrian text. We're going to talk about them in a minute. It is the majority text. That's what, if you hear, uh, if you hear, there are several names for these. These are manuscripts. These are Greek manuscripts, ancient Greek manuscripts. And some of them are fragments, and some of them are whole books. Uh, and by the way, we're talking about the New Testament because the Old Testament is the same because the Hebrew are meticulous in copying uh, their scriptures. And them scribes, they would assign letters, I mean numbers to every word, uh, to every letter. And so whenever they translated, just think about this, just think about, okay, you spent, they're writing this thing by hand, let's say you spent three weeks writing a uh, copying this portion of scripture and then you add up all the numbers and they don't add up. You know what you got to do? And start over. So it's meticulous. So we're just talking about the New Testament. Because the Old Testament and all these translations, regardless of what uh, what line of manuscripts come from, are the same. But the majority, if you hear the majority text is the same as the textus receptus and it's also called the western and it's called the maybe Byzantine 
Maybe that's how you spell that. All of that's the same deal. Talk about the same family of manuscripts that is translated into the Bible. And this is where we get the King James out of this Textus Receptus. And, there, and the Textus Receptus has 5,800 Greek manuscripts, 10,000 Latin, 9,300 from other oldest translations, Gothic, Syrian, Coptic, Latin, uh, Orthodox Greek, and they, they tra they've spoken the same language all along, preserved this text. Dating back to the second century, and was used to translate Bibles, the one that Martin Luther used in Germany. It was translated into Italian and French, Spanish, Hungarian, Dutch, the Russian. Uh, Y'all heard of Tyndale? Uh, he, wrote, he translated the Bible in 1525 out of the Texas Receptus. Geneva Bible. Have y'all heard about the Geneva Bible? Y'all need to do a little church history study. Uh, and in the King James 1611. All of these Bibles came out of these texts that they've been that have been found. And, and these texts were found, the reason called Western is they were found in Europe. And, and that's going to come into play when we talk about this other uh, family of uh, Bibles. So Stanley was built. Say what? Stanley was built. Yeah, they passed down through it. And the Catholic Church, I mean, you know, they, they preserved uh, you know, they had they had scribes that were that were copying these things too. And so uh, but that's that and we'll talk about why uh, it being translated from the majority text is important in a minute. Here's another thing. The 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 uh, the, the King James Bible is a literal word for word translation. And so, I, pick your other English translation. NIV, ESV, NET, NASB, NLT. I mean, name them all. Here's what they do. Here's the King James. And so, so if you got these Greek words in the text, every one of those lines is a Greek word. The Bible translators... They put an English word for every Greek word. This is why the King James is hard to read. For every Greek word, you got an English word. And that's why you got to stumble through it. it, it, it sometimes it's, it's awkward. And how it, and it, you got to read it again, especially reading the old King James. Sometimes you got to read that verse two or three times to figure out, okay, what is he trying to say? Because every Greek word has an English word. All of them others... All of them, all the all the different versions. Here's what they do. You got these Greek words and these manuscripts, and they say, "Well, okay, uh, this Greek word and this Greek word and this Greek word, we're gonna put an English word here, and then we're gonna put one, two, three, four English words to translate this one Greek word, and then and then we're gonna put an extra word in here that isn't even found in the text right here because it's it." it can't understand it without it. And so what that's called is dynamic equivalence. So when you're reading these Bibles, you're not reading the words of God. You're reading a, an interpretation of a translator that says, this is what the Greek text says. Now I've got to explain it in a way that you can understand it. And so, and so they group these words together. It's called dynamic equivalence. And that's why it's easy to read. That's why it flows easily. And, and I'm not saying it's a terrible thing, but I'm just saying what I want to know is what do the words of God say? And, and if I have trouble stumbling through it, then I, I, you know, I can go read these, but then when I want to go back and study it, I want to go back and say, what is it? What is it? So the King James is a literal word-for-word -word translation. Here's another big one. Here's another reason why we use the King James in teaching in this church that 90% of the sermons that were saved uh, from the second, when I say second to six centuries that are written on paper, you know, you know, you get up here in Oliver and he puts the, uh, we put the scriptures on the, on the board. And so uh, uh, pastors are always quoting scripture in their message. And so 90% of the sermons that were preached in from the second to the sixth century used the majority text. And it used the other text that these other Bibles are translated out of. Here's another reason we do it. The greatest movement of God's Spirit on mankind in human history, the Reformation, used the King James Bible. 
Did you know since the time of the Reformation, there has been more souls won? The gospel has gone to more countries, and, and there has been more prosperity on earth because of the King James Bible. God used it. God used it. Another thing, it was adult, it was authorized by a king. Yeah, so what does that have to do with anything? Somebody read there, Ecclesiastes 8.4. I'll do it. For the word of a king, there is power. Do you know what the governmental system of this book is? Anybody? It's a monarchy. Do you find democracy anywhere in this book? No. You can find principles for democracy, but God is a monarchist. You know, we got a king coming. Jesus. I hope you're a monarchist. I want to be ruled by a king. I want to be ruled by King Jesus. And God had raised up a king, James. You know what James translated in English is? Jacob. God had a king raised up with a Hebrew name, James. And James was not a moral man. That has nothing to do with it. God uses immoral guys all the time to do his stuff. You look at it. raised up a king to give us his word. It, and it came from England. I've got to run out of time here. The empire that God used to usher in the end times was in England. You, did, okay, if you have what, okay, uh, you got what? What time you got on your walk? What time you got on your walk? <laughs> Which one's right? <laughs> How do you find out who's right? Look at your phone. <laughs> <laughs> and what's that based on? <laughs> it's based on England. <laughs> it's based on England. What about temperature? What's that based on? Unit, thermal unit. England. What about where you are on this planet? Longitude, latitude. If you're going to pinpoint yourself on this planet, what do you got to know? Longitude Where's Latin. England? All that's based on England. Why would you not want a book that wasn't come from where God is using uh, this empire to, to facilitate these things in these last days? All right, we've got to roll. Uh, it was translated before German rationalism. Uh, you'll, we just might talk about that next week a little bit. Uh, it's corrupted everything. Higher criticism. Uh, divine guidance on chapter and verse numbers. Did you know every one of these other translations, and I guess we're going to get to them next week, uh, they all use the King James uh, system for uh, where the verses and the chapters are. There's a reason for that. The Holy Spirit moved on this deal. Mm -hmm. Here's another one that you might not think about. There's no copyright on King James Bible. Do you think God is going to put his word out with a copyright on it? Where you got to get permission from somebody before you copy that book? No. The King James doesn't have a copyright. And here's the most important thing. This is the most important thing that we can know that the Bible we got in this King James Bible are the words of God. It says in Psalm 12, 6, the words of the Lord are pure words. Like silver tried in a furnace of the earth, purified seven times, you shall keep them, O Lord. Listen to this. You shall preserve them for this generation forever. God preserves his word. Do you think there's errors in this Bible? Is God not big enough that he created the universe and all of these things we know and see? In the Bible that he has used to evangelize the world in the last 500 years, do you think his word is not preserved right there? It says he preserved his word. Why you want to mess with that? All right. How much time we got now? You're done. <laughs> I really don't want to be done there. All right. Next week we're going to talk about the minority text, and then we'll move on. Uh, we're going to talk about, uh, we're not going to, yeah, we might bash on a little bit. Uh, we're going to talk about all the other modern English translations that you're reading are not based on the majority text. They're based on a different family of manuscripts, the minority text. And I'll just tell you that, that uh, 
95%, 95% of the manuscripts that are found in the Bible are in this right here. And 5% of the manuscripts that are all of these NIV and NIV. What I have is a list of them. ASB, NASB, NIV, NLT, ESV. I mean, on and on and on. They're all based right here on the minority text. And the minority text is where all the early church heresies came from. And they got a lot of problems. And so we'll talk a little bit about that next week. Uh, I want you to be confident that the book you have that we're studying out of has the Word of God in it. Yes, ma'am. I just want to make a statement that when I was raised in the Catholic Church, I was blessed because we used the old English. Yeah. 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 And and look, uh, like I said, uh, other translations you might like better, they might read better, and I'm not telling you to go throw away all your Bibles. (laughs) But I'm just telling you what we're studying in this class, I believe and I'm confident is the Word of God. And I, I, I hope you can too. And let's pray. Lord, we do praise and thank you that you have preserved your word, and we can trust it, and we can believe it, and Lord, it can impact our lives, Lord God. I just pray, uh, Lord, that uh, as we go further in this class, uh, Lord, that that you'll open our hearts and minds, Lord, to understand what it is you'd have us to understand. We ask in Jesus' name, amen. amen.